Amen. Woo. Good morning. Welcome to Fishers United Methodist Church on this 150th anniversary. Yeah. <clears throat> Pretty exciting stuff. Uh, after service, of course, there'll be a meal down in the gym. I want to encourage you as you exit after uh, service, go find a seat in the gym. We'll dismiss, we'll pray, we'll dismiss by table. Uh, and if you're wondering what smells so good this morning, it's me. Um, I have fried up 10 pounds of bacon this morning for the green beans. And uh, it's my new bacon and onion cologne. It smells quite tasty. Well, again, welcome to Fishers United Methodist Church. It is a blessing to be together in worship this morning. I want to encourage everybody as we begin to fill out the Connect card which is located, of course, in that pew back in front of you. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering plates uh, later on when the plates are passed. And if you have any prayer requests, please list those there. Also want to encourage everybody, if you have yet to download the, the, the church's app, uh, you can do that by clicking on the QR code that is on the pew back in front of you. One of them is labeled uh, for the app. The other one is labeled uh, for the announcements. Uh, after you download that app, if you haven't yet, click on the one labeled announcements. You can see all that's happening in the life of the church. There's a lot going on uh, in the coming weeks, in the coming months. You can see uh, everything highlighted there. Uh, a couple things that we do want to highlight, though, uh, this morning. First, we've got a men's study that begins April 24th, There will be, which is a Wednesday. There will be two options, Wednesday night and then a Thursday morning. Uh, for the study uh, on Tim Keller's book, Counterfeit Gods. Everybody in here knows my deep heart for Tim Keller, and it was the first book I ever read by him, and uh, it's a phenomenal book on issues of idolatry. Again, men's study Wednesday nights thir or Thursday morning, and you can sign up for that by going to, uh, to the app, to the announcements page on the app or on the church website. Next, are you new to church and wondering what is next? Uh, many people ask what's next when they are looking to get involved and grow in faith. And our assimilation director, Lee, Lisa, right there, everybody knows Lisa. Our assimilation director, Lisa Elsesser, and her amazing team work hard to welcome and get people connected and involved in the church. We believe that everyone here uh, has walked into Fishers United Methodist Church for a reason. We believe God has brought you here uh, for a purpose, and we exist to help you find the perfect place to serve and to grow more fully into the likeness of Jesus Christ. On Sunday, April 28th, from 1045 to 12 in Fellowship Hall, which is where the uh, food pantry is housed across the, uh, uh, across the parking lot in that uh, direction, but on Sunday, April 28th, from 10:45 to 12 in Fellowship Hall, uh, we're offering our next next opportunity. This next opportunity focuses on missions and ministries in the church. It will be a fun way to learn about great ways to serve and to get involved. Prizes, prizes are guaranteed. Sign up for the prizes. I mean. Come and learn and get a prize. Can't beat that. Uh, the invitation is open now for you to come and be a part of Next. You won't regret it. And to sign up for Next, you can either mark the word Next on that Connect card and drop it in the offering basket, or you can sign up on the church app under the announcement tab or uh, the church website um, under the announcement tab there on the website. And now as we begin service this morning, I want to take a moment uh, to thank uh, several people for today. I want to thank the church staff. Um, without them, the, the meal that is coming uh, would not be there. It's been complete staff involvement. Also thank everybody who brought a dessert as well. Uh, I want to take a, a moment here to thank, where are Kim and Greg, aren't it? Yes, there they are. Would you just stand up for a second, both of you? Um, Kim and Greg have been incredibly passionate uh, about our 150th anniversary. Uh, Kim, uh, countless hours, I can only imagine hundreds of hours, uh, put together like a legit history book on uh, Fishers United Methodist, and it's called Growing Together, History of Fishers UMC from 1874 to the Present. And if you would like a copy of that, they're five bucks. You can see Kim or whoever's out at the table out here. 
uh, for one. If you've already pre-purchased or pre-ordered one, you can get that out there as well. Let's take a moment and thank Kim for this. It's amazing. Absolutely incredible, and I do want to take a moment um, because I feel like I need to highlight this, but the meal today, uh, Kim and Greg have generously provided for, and so thank you guys for that as well. Yeah. I also want to thank Dave Nelson. I don't know where Dave is. Oh, there's Dave. He's back there doing something. Dave has graciously provided us all these rocks that you see up front, and if you're wondering why they are there, you'll find out later, all right? That's, that's a tease for later, all right? But you'll find out later. So, Mr. Dave, thank you for providing uh, these rocks. Yep. And then uh, the Fitzgerald family, who are seated up front here, uh, but... Miss Jeanette over here, we want to give thanks to her. She is graciously uh, adding her God-given talent uh, to the worship service this morning, and we look forward to the finish, the completion of uh, her artistry uh, over there. So I'm really excited about that, and so thanks, Miss Jeanette. Again, it is great to be together this morning. I am excited to be present with you this morning. There is a lot packed into this service, and... Uh, We're going to go before the Lord now. Would you bow in prayer with me? Father, I give you thanks for this day. I give you thanks, Lord God, for your goodness, for the grace that you have poured out to us, for the redemptive love, Lord God, that you have showered upon us through the work of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, uh, Father, this morning as we celebrate the past, as we consider the present, as we look to the future, Father, may the Spirit sweep through this place and move in our hearts, move in our minds, Lord God. Bind us nearer to your heart, bind us nearer to one another, and uh, Father, I give you thanks for the blessing of being able to serve in ministry uh, here at Fishers United Methodist and for the blessing of this, my brothers and sisters in Christ that I get to walk with on a daily and weekly basis. And so, Father, may the Spirit move Draw us before your throne of grace and mercy now. And and Lord God, change and transform us this day. Renew us more fully into into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Get it. Well, good morning, everybody. Please stand with us as we worship God today. He is the cornerstone of our kingdom. on his 
The roots of Fishers United Methodist Church are deep in Fishers, Indiana, but the roots of the Methodist Church are more than a history lesson. It's a story of service, fellowship, and discipleship to the surrounding community. It's a story of a church that evolved to meet the ever-changing needs of the community around it. A church that grew in both size and faith while finding new ways to spread the love of God and share the good news of Jesus Christ. The seeds were planted 150 years ago through the foresight of the city's founder. During the establishment of the city of Fishers, then known as Fishers Switch, the Fisher family donated land for the specific use of a church and a lodge. This church opened its doors in 1874 and became the first official congregation in the community. The church remained at this location for the next 30 years until the congregation felt the need for an exclusive building designated for only congregational worship. In 1905, the church building that still stands today on Lantern Road was built. This building served as a meeting place for worship and through several rounds of growth provided classrooms and meeting space for Bible studies and multiple Sunday school classes. 50 years after the opening of the Lantern Road Church, the demands of a growing Fishers community once again called for the need of expansion. So in 1961, the congregation decided to move east of I-69 on 116th Street. This was made possible thanks to the generous donation of two and a half acres by the Reynolds family. After several rounds of fundraising and congregational commitments, the church was able to break ground on a new facility in the summer of 1962. The first service in that building was held on Christmas of that year. The new facility provided much needed classrooms for Bible studies and the continuing growth of the church's youth ministry. As the community continued to grow, so did the church, adding additional classrooms, a dedicated choir room, and meeting space. By the time the 1980s came around, Fisher's UMC was becoming one of the fastest growing congregations in the state, offering more than a dozen Sunday school classes and fellowship programs for youth, teens, and adults. Among these offerings to the community was the start of the Mother's Day Out preschool program, which started in 1987. By 1990, membership was at an all-time high and new plans for expansion were in the works. 
These plans included a 600-person sanctuary, additional restrooms, a new choir room, and much, much more. By June 28, 1992, the first service was held in the new sanctuary. There were several other rounds of changes adding preschool and Bible study classrooms over the next several years. The addition of the Family Life Center provided opportunities for the congregation to minister in a multitude of ways, including children and youth activities, upward basketball, and adult events. We added upward as a way of uh, drawing people not in from our own congregation, but from the community. And from the get-go, we had a number of people who would sign up their uh, children to play upward basketball who were not a part of our church, but they were exposed to the church and a part of the upward program involves a devotional done by the coaches, so they were getting that exposure to the faith. In 2007, the church purchased the Lions Club next door, which made room for additional event space, as well as a perfect place to launch a food pantry. Several people, Linda Williams, a former choir director, was the one who uh, really saw the need and with some help from a couple of other people initially started the idea and then it spread. People uh, became enthusiastic about it. I still talk to some people that work at the food pantry and what a, what a vital ministry that is in their lives because they feel it's a way they feel that they are making a difference and putting their ministry into action. And so the food pantry has and continues to be a very, very vital ministry at the church. The church was not only adapting its facilities to meet the needs of the community, it was also changing the way in which it was engaging with the people around them. The church has to be adapting all the time. I mean, a community like Fishers uh, is adapting. It's changing at a breakneck pace. We did a lot of work to move into, finally, the 21st century, not just in internal administration and infrastructure, but also in terms of uh, reaching out on websites, uh, digital platforms, uh, social media. So learning how to tell our story in ways that uh, let the community know that we are available, uh, we're offering things that might be useful to them, uh, and uh, wanting to partner with them in their lives for anything from uh, personal financial uh, accountability, uh, support groups for young parents, uh, uh, and anywhere we saw an opportunity arise, there was almost always somebody who seemed to step forward and say, uh, we'd like to be a part of that. As you can see, Fisher's UMC has had a strong history of evolving to meet the needs of the community. The generosity and the commitment of the congregation has made the dream of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ a reality. I focus more on uh, Jesus' two commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And I think we do that through what happens in the building, worship, classes, and so forth. But then the second uh, great commandment was love your neighbors yourself. So try to make contact with people and show them that we love God through the way that we love them. The church offers the gospel. And uh, with, if the church no longer could do that, uh, the community would be greatly impoverished and folks would miss the joy of what God has in store for all of us. So I see a long forward look for this congregation. I mean, today's celebration of 150 years is, is an amazing thing. Uh, I just pray that God blesses the community uh, and this congregation for many, many, many more years uh, for our good and His glory.
phenomenal. Thank you so much. What a blessing it is to be here in the house of the Lord today and to celebrate 150 years of ministry of Methodism in the community of Fishers. We are very, very blessed to be here today. We're, we're also blessed to have a number of people with us who have and continue to be an important part of the ministry of this church. And all told, there are 36 senior pastors who have served the church in 150 years and 11 associate pastors. And a few of those are with us today. Kevin McKinney could not be here. He is traveling in a way, but Mike Reed is here. Hilda Bickle, whose husband Bob served as interim, is here as well. I think Jackie Chandler is here. We also have people who are here who went out from this church to launch into ministry, as well as retired pastors from other congregations who now attend this church, and many others who are in ministry. I'm going to ask, if you fit into any of those categories, would you stand up right now so that we can recognize you as an important part of the ministry of this church? Go ahead. Mike, lead the way back there, brother. Stand up. That's phenomenal. This day would not be possible if it were not for people like them who have led the way, and I simply stand on their shoulders, and I am so grateful for all of them. I know that, uh, in particular, Mike has welcomed me into... The Isaac and Jacob. Then they sent their brother Joseph packing to Egypt. And it was there that the Israelites moved as a family. They all relocated into Egypt because of famine in the land until they were enslaved in a horrible situation. And then Moses came along. Moses and Aaron came along to lead them out of that. That leads us up to where we are so far in this year-long study. And we want to focus today on just a few of those as Joshua enters the promised land, and we're going to take a look at that story today. Let's, let's just back out and take a look at a couple of those people, and those are Moses and Joshua. You know, as we reflect on our church's history, we know that when the people crossed the Jordan River, they were reflecting on their history. So let's take a look at their history and see the applications for our history and maybe even our own personal lives if we reflect on what has been given to us and where we will go with our life and with our faith as we look back and look forward. In order to understand where they were at this moment when they're ready to cross the Jordan River, we know that there were several aspects in place. I'm just going to call them today the man, the mission, the miracle, the message and the memorial. And looking back in that moment, as their leader Moses had died, not taking them into the promised land, but as he had died, we see that Moses was their man. They had relied on him for 40 years. His mission was to take them out of Egyptian bondage. The greatest of the miracles was walking through the Red Sea that had dried up. And the message, God is with you. If God is with you, you cannot fail. And their big memorial they took, that they developed over that time, was the Ark of the Covenant. We'll take a look at that here in a moment. So now it's on Joshua. And much like I am here today, he was standing on the shoulders of Moses, yet he was the leader. And he had to figure out how to lead these people and what to do with them. So Joshua then becomes the man. The mission is to take them into the promised land. The miracle is the Jordan River, just like the Red Sea would be dried up. The message was the same. And it's the same today. 
God is with you and the memorial, these 12 stones from the Jordan River. Let's take a look and see the key players that entered the promised land. The first one we're going to take a look at today is Joshua. And Joshua's job was to lead the people into the promised land. No small task. It was a very large group of people. They said 600,000 military soldiers. I mean, probably 2 million total people to lead them across this river and into this land. They had to figure out how to do it. And Joshua was tapped to be that leader. His first task was to hear what he was supposed to do. And this is what he heard. Be strong and courageous because, Joshua, you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Here's what you're going to do, and here's how you're going to do it. Be strong and very courageous. Here's how. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Now listen, folks. For us in our lives, when we think about how to take the next steps and how to raise a family and, and how to move forward and whatever God's calling us to do, if we look at the word of God and say we shall not turn to the right or to the left, but go right down the middle of the word of God, that is always the best way to travel. And these are the words that were given to Joshua. So he was told what to do, go to the promised land. He was told how to do it, and that is oh, be careful to obey all the law. And then he was told why. And, and the why he was going to be successful wasn't based upon him. It was based upon the goodness of God. He, he would want to give up. He would, he would feel times when he was weak or afraid or, or discouraged. And so God spoke these words, says, Have I not commanded you... Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. You'll have fear. Do not be discouraged even when you feel like it. Why? For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It's this same promise of the presence of God. No matter where we go in life. That God said, I will be with you. Jesus said the same thing when he was ready to ascend into heaven. He gave us the great commission, and he said, and I will be with you to the end of the age. It is a promise of God to never leave us, to never forsake us, to always be with us. Josh wasn't the only player as they were crossing the Jordan River. There were also these priests, and their job was to carry the ark into the river, in the ark of the covenant. If you're not sure, just think Indiana Jones. And now you got the story. <laughs> Joshua, Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went on ahead of them. What was so special about this, this Ark? The Bible tells us that it was a gold-covered Ark of the Covenant and it contained three things. A gold jar of manna. Manna was the bread-like substance that fell down from heaven and fed the people for all those years in the desert. The second was Aaron's staff that had budded. And it was a, a symbolic moment of their rebellion when they had said, I don't need to follow God. I can go my own way. I can do whatever I want. And Aaron's staff budded and bloomed and blossomed and it, it produced almonds. It did all these amazing, this dead stick did all these things as a sign to say God is the one who's in charge. And the third thing that was inside the Ark of the Covenant were the stone tablets, the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from the mountain. See, these were God's provision, God's call, and God's ways. And they, they carried them with them where they went. And so these priests were told to take the Ark of the Covenant and to, to dip their toes into the edge of the Jordan River, which, by the way, was then, at that season, would be in flood stage. What would happen? Well, as soon as the priests who carried the Ark of the Lord, the, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. See this picture that Jeanette is painting, and you'd think, well, that's impossible. A river doesn't come down and just stop like a wall. Well, it did. 
And it was God's sign for them that God, first of all, was more powerful than any river, more powerful than any people. And that God would provide a way for these, these millions of people to cross through on dry land while the river was normally at flood stage. The third set of players we got to focus on are these, these 12 men, and their job was to gather 12 stones and to build a memorial. The Bible says this, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, so it's important the entire nation of Israel was represented, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So they picked up these, these boulders, these, put them on their shoulder, and carried them over and built a monument. Built a monument so that people could see them. Now, there were a fourth set of players, and it was everybody else, the people. And the people were to, to link up with these previous ones that we've already discussed here this morning. Their first job was to follow that leader, the, lead, the Joshua the, who's leading the people in the promised land. And here's what they said in Joshua chapter 1. Then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. So the people are echoing the same words that God gave to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. They're saying the same thing. We've got your back. You take us, we will follow. You know, a, a leader has to have followers in order to be a leader. And the people said, Joshua, we are with you. The second thing they needed to do was to honor God's holiness. And this related to the priests who were to carry the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Ark of the Covenant, into the river. How could they honor God's holiness and all of that? Well, it says it in Joshua chapter 3. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not Go near it. Respect it as holy. 2,000 cubits. I don't know if you use cubits as a normal measurement around your house. I don't. So I looked it up. How, how long would that be? About 3,000 feet. About 10 football fields. A little over half a mile. In other words, like this water stopped. And where the, where the priests are with the ark, you, you folks stay a half mile away from that. Because it is, it is the reverence of God, the holiness of God. And honor God's holiness in this moment. And remember this moment. Honor God's holiness in everything that you do. And then, with the 12 men who are gathering the stones and building this memorial, the people's job is to tell God's story. And this, to me, is where it gets interesting. Here's what it says in Joshua chapter 4. In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples on the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Tell God's story. If you are here today and you have a son or a daughter, you have grandchildren, nephews, nieces, you have family members, I believe that your greatest responsibility is to tell God's story in your family. We 
have this awesome responsibility to raise our families, to educate them, to prepare them to be contributing citizens to the nation, and so many more things. But I believe that the greatest, most awesome responsibility every parent and grandparent has is to tell God's story over and over and over again. A baseline, a very beginning, not the ending, but a very beginning place is to bring your kids to this room to worship every single Sunday. It's a, it's a beginning point. You can have these connections and conversations about what took place in there and say, you know, this guy was up there and he was talking and dad or mom or grandma and grandpa, like what, like, what did this mean and help me understand it. And you can begin to tell the story over and over and over again. My dad and mom made sure that I was in church every Sunday. I never thought about it. Just got up and got dressed and got in the car. It wasn't like a debate or negotiation. It was just something we did. My, my parents weren't in ministry at all. They had secular jobs, but we were just in church every Sunday. I, I've thought about this really hard of, of late. I don't know that I would be a pastor today if I hadn't been sitting every single week absorbing what was taking place around me, not understanding a bunch of it when I was young, not understanding some of it when I got older, still not understanding some of it today. I mean, it's, it's complex. But just absorbing. I don't know that I'd be a pastor. I'm not sure that I'd be a Christian. I'm not sure. I had a very scientific mind. I went to Purdue University and studied, you know, mathematics and, and like I, I, very scientific background, very scientific mind. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I might have out of God's sovereignty, but I cannot impress upon you enough that the value of, of telling God's story. And so when the scripture says, when, you're, when your children ask you, when your, your children's children ask you, like, what, what do these stones mean and what are they about? Tell them God's story. Tell them what God has done for you. Tell them how God has been in your life. Tell them the story in our life. Tell them the story of Jesus. Tell them about the cross. Tell them about the tomb. Tell them the tomb is empty. Tell them that Jesus is still with them. Tell them about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God who resides in each one of them. Tell them the story of God in your life. There is no greater task, no greater responsibility that every parent has than to take memorial stones of your life and tell the story of God. There's a, a fourth thing. Oh, there were a lot more. But there's a fourth thing I want to highlight, and that is the people were responsible to live God's future. It wasn't like they could cross the Jordan River and say, well, we're done. They had to now occupy the land. They had enemies to defeat. They had places to send the various tribes of people. I mean, it's like a lot of people to spread throughout, throughout Israel. They, they had to, to turn into a people who knew how to raise crops. Remember, they had been slaves, and then for the next 40 years, slaves for 400 years, and then 40 years wandering in the desert, they didn't know how to form a government. They didn't know how to build cities. They didn't know how to, to raise crops. They didn't know how to... I mean, they, they needed to learn how to do everything, and they had to live this future in the faithfulness of God in their life. And that's where we are today. We've already heard about some of the history of this church that goes a long, long, long way back. And we are so grateful for those who believed in it enough to plant a ministry that today we would be here celebrating as we have seen, this first little building was built in 1874 is when the land was given. It was completed in 1875, and so 150 years ago from 1874, on what would later become 116th Street, though I don't think it was quite as busy back in the day. And here, here's, the first, here's the one question I have for you today. In 1874, I can just take this by a show of hands. How many were part of the congregation at that time? I'm not saying all oh, y'all look old. I'm just saying, I'm just saying like none of us, not a single one of us 
gave that first offering. None of us built that first building. None of us taught that first Sunday school class. None of us went on that first mission adventure. And the list goes on. And we simply all stand on the shoulders of all of those who have gone before us. And we acknowledge that they did something for the future that we today are blessed by. How incredible is that? As you've seen in 1905, the second building was, was constructed 30 years later on Lantern Road. Then in 1962, 57 years after that, we relocated to this site. And the sanctuary was uh, that away back there, which is now a bunch of classrooms and office space. And then in 1992, this sanctuary was built. In 2003, 11 years later, the gym was built. In 2024, now 21 years after that, here we are today. It's 150 years all together. And we celebrate, do we not? We celebrate. Here's what I've been thinking. Now, we can look backwards 150 years years. But we can also look ahead 150 years. And another show of hands, how many of you plan to be around for the 300th anniversary? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yet, here we, here's, here's only two things I know. If there is still Methodism in Fishers 150 years from now, there's only two things I know. Number one, Jesus has not come back yet. We don't know. Could be today. Could be 150 years from now. Could be 1,000 years. We just don't know the day. The only other thing I know is that we'll all be dead. That's it. That's all I really know. That we'll all be dead. And so does that relieve us from the responsibility of doing something for the future? 150 years from now, 100 years from now, 50 years from now, 25 years from now? Because we may or may not be here. I hope not, because if that had been the attitude of the people 150 years ago, or 100 years ago, or 75 years ago, we wouldn't be here today. And so we are, have this responsibility for the future, just like they had a responsibility for us. So on this day, we're launching the implementation of our endowment fund, an endowment Fund by a church is something where money is invested for the future. By definition, the money will outlast your life. The endowment will outlast your life as the interest is used for a future ministry, for future missions, for future whatever. We can't even imagine the future. And typically, you don't want to make the endowment gifts super specific. For example, in 1874, 150 years ago, it would not have been a good thing if all of the money from the church went into the railroad ministry. <laughs> it was a big deal back when it was called Fisher's Switch and when the railroad was coming through. Today, not a lot of railroad traffic passing through Fisher's, Indiana. And so you don't know what the future holds. I mean, the future is unimaginable. We can't even comprehend what it will be like. We do our best and we create movies about it. We imagine a future with flying cars and a back to the future. And we imagine all kinds of things. We simply don't know. But here's what I do know. God will be in that future. We don't know the technical things. We don't know what's going to happen with the world. We don't know what transportation or technology or governments or, or political systems. We don't know anything about that. But here's what I know. God will be in that future. And so we entrust ourselves to God for that. So we're launching that today. And here in a few moments, we have this moment. You, you received an, an envelope when you came in with, with an endowment envelope. And here in a few moments, this is not, look, this is not about lots of money to come in today. This is just about us making a connection and saying we believe in the future. So here's what we've said. Because it's the 150th, if you'd like to give $15 or, or just commit that, that's great. $150, that's amazing. $1,500, we got to go for it. If you have $15 million you brought in today and you want to unload it, <laughs> we'll take it. That's what I'm saying. Your wallet's thick and you just got to make it lighter. You know, we'll, we'll take it. 
It, you know, the, the idea is not, this is not a, a campaign for lots of money. It's more a lot about lots of people. And the, the upside of this would be if everybody said, I'm in. If it's $1.50, I'm in. I, I'm in. So you have an envelope there with you today to say, how can we think about the future? And when, after we're going to take a look at something here in a moment about that future, about that endowment, we'll invite you up. And you can place it in these baskets that are here. And then take one of these stones with you and take it back and take it home and make it a memorial stone so that you can share God's story with your family. Would you join me in prayer? We thank you so much, our Heavenly Father, for your many, many good things that you have given to us. We are, we're so grateful today for the opportunity to think about your future. And we have no idea what it will be like. The only thing that we know is that you will be in it. We might not, but you will be in it. So God, we thank you, we honor you, we bless you in your holy name. And pray that everything that we think and say and do among our families, in our community, and in our world would bring honor and blessing and glory to you. We thank you for all of those who've gone before us. For 150 years, the, the hardworking and dedicated members of this faith community that have become what it is today. I personally thank you for the pastors, and associate pastors who've come before me and I just can walk in the door and stand on their shoulders and celebrate your goodness with them. I thank you, Lord, that not only have we had the people and the, the leaders and the pastors in this church, but that Jesus Christ, you have been at the center of this congregation from day one. And you will continue to be well into the future. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. And we pray, we pray that in every way you would be glorified on this day and all the days to come. We pray all these things in the beautiful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Take a look. Hello, my name is Tiffany Frash. I am a lay leader here at Fishers United Methodist Church, and I want to talk to you about legacy. Legacy is defined as the long-lasting impact of particular events or actions in a person's life. Legacy can come from one's character, one's faith, or maybe it's the example of the way you live your life. No matter how you define it, a legacy endures. It impacts the world beyond our lives, giving us the opportunity to eternally reflect God's love to those who need His light in their lives. One way in which people are already investing in their legacy is through the Fishers United Methodist Church Endowment Fund. This endowment empowers our church to continue its mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It establishes a deep-rooted foundation of outreach and ministry to touch the community around us for years to come. As a matter of fact, the roots of the Methodist Church in Fishers, Indiana is a story of legacy. The legacy of one man who saw beyond his years to plant a seed that would change his community for the next 150 years. In 1872, Salathiel donated a lot on 116th Street on the north side which was located just west of where the Shell Station is today for the purpose of a start of a church and also a lodge. It had a two-story frame building on it, and the church was in the bottom half and the lodge was in the top. And in 1874, the, the Methodist Episcopal Church was established there in that building. He would not live to see that fruition because he he died in 1873, and here we are 150 years later, uh, still enjoying his giving of that gift or endowment uh, to us. 
the principles of legacy go far beyond celestial fisher and they go back to the Bible themselves. You know, King David was the most important king in Israel's history and he was a thousand years before Jesus. And one of the things he wanted to do more than anything was to build the temple for God. It says this, after David was settled in his own palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house made of cedar while the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. Nathan replied to David, whatever you have in mind, do it for God is with you. So David went to bed that night thinking, I'm going to get to build God a temple. But that night the Lord came to Nathan and Nathan turned around and said to King David, when your days are over and you go to be with your ancestors, in other words, when you die and you're buried, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me. So what do you think David did? Do you think he gave up on the whole idea? No, he didn't. He responded, with all my resources, I have provided for the temple of God. Gold for gold, silver for silver, bronze for the bronze work, iron for the iron, and wood for the woodwork. He says, I'm gonna give onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, all kinds of fine stone and marble, all kinds of large quantities of things the Bible says. David knew he would never see the results, but he still took from his wealth and gave mightily. To me, that's what an endowment is. An endowment is giving to something that will outlive us, outlive our children, outlive our grandchildren. Even though David never got to experience the temple, even though Celestial Fisher never got to experience the church building, we give now, not knowing what experiences and needs and ministries will be used in the future by those funds that will be a blessing to the community, to the world, and to one another. Fishers United Methodist Church has made an incredible impact on my family, on myself, on my husband, on my son, and on my mother. This church was here for my family in some of our darkest times. Whether we were facing the loss of a child, a cancer diagnosis, an unexpected divorce, this church community stood by us and lifted us up when we didn't think we could lift ourselves. This church community helped us understand that no matter our past, that God was with us. And this community showed up time and time again to reflect the love of Jesus Christ when my family needed it most. Going forward, it would be my hope that this church could continue to provide a light for people in the community that are in the dark. There are so many people out there hurting and you never know who might walk through the doors of this church seeking support, seeking that light that light that we know as the love of Jesus Christ. At various tables around here, we have some of these. These aren't, these aren't just like rocks. These are really nice stones. And I want you to take one home and put it in a prominent place and make it something that is a reflection of your faith, of Jesus, who is the true rock of this church and the impact it's had on your life so that when your children and your children's children and your children's children's children ask their parents, what does this mean? You can tell them the story. You can tell them the story. We invite everyone to come and, and take one of these and, 
And when you do, if, if you have one of these that you'd like to, to drop in, we have some baskets here. You can put it, anything else, your Connect card, anything else that you, you didn't get turned in earlier, you can put that in the basket that is here with you today. And let's make this a moment of saying, I believe that God has our very best at heart. We are thankful for God, and I can't wait to tell his story. Heavenly Father, we love your story. And we know that long before we were here, 150 years ago, others planted a ministry in a tiny community. No idea that later we would be in this location among over 100,000 people. And we don't know what the future looks like either. But we believe in you. And it's your story that we want to tell. Thank you, God, for your goodness and your blessing and your kindness and your grace. In your holy name. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Would all of you please stand? And when you are ready to do so, you can just come forward. Let us worship the Lord.
beside you, all around you, and within you. He is with you, He is with you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, in your weeping, and rejoicing. He is for you, He is for you. so much for your good blessings that you give to us at all times and pray that you would continue to receive our blessings that we offer back to you in your holy name we pray amen please be seated we are blessed today to be able to baptize to children in the faith of Jesus Christ what an appropriate day so Joe and Jessica can you bring your children to the front, please. Up here. Hi. <laughs> Priorities there, that's how that works. We are so privileged today. Um, to have Joe and Jessica Montgomery and Brother Logan as well for the baptism of Grace and Elizabeth. What a, what a, and Madison, I'm sorry, what a, what a real blessing it is to have you here today. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Isn't that beautiful? So, Mom and Dad, I ask you, on behalf of your children, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin, if so say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil and justice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If so, say, I do. It's okay. And here's a perfect question for this moment. Will you nurture these children? There you have it. In Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. If so, say, I will. And she's agreeing right now, I'm telling you that. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in the faith, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? If so, say, we will. We will. will you proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ? Will you surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others? Will you pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. If so, say, 
we will. It's not in here, but will you be willing to work in the nursery? You want to go first, Grace? The water here. What name is given to this child? Grace. Grace Marie Elizabeth Montgomery. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May God work within you and through you today and all the days of your life. Amen. Good job. What name is given this child? Madison Joanne Montgomery. Madison Joanne Montgomery. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May God rest within you that you may serve him all the days of your life. Amen. You're not supposed to touch water. Isn't that great? Here, come here. Hold my hand. Take a walk with me. Brothers and sisters of the faith, this is your family. That means you get to change the diapers. That means you get to love them. It means you get to look after them in children's ministry and in youth ministry. And as they grow into adulthood, you get to sit beside them and work beside them and serve beside them and, and love them. You see, none of us does faith by ourselves. That's kind of the point of today's service, right? We stand on the shoulders of, of people who've gone before us and, and these beautiful young children are standing on the shoulders of others. They're, they're on yours. They're in your care. And they are loved by God uniquely and beautifully and you get to participate. You hear the music playing? Let's join in the singing of Jesus loves me for this beautiful family. Wasn't that beautiful? We are very blessed to have with us today our superintendent, Senator Michael. He is here today to give us his blessings and blessings from our bishop. We invited the bishop, but he could not be here. He had other engagements that he had to attend to. So welcome my boss. Let me say that Jesus is our boss, and thank you for the message. Thank you for your leadership. Jeffrey, Jessica, Grace, Madson, you did awesome. <laughs> we thank God for you. As an extension of the bishop uh, the conference superintendent uh, for North Central District, I feel proud and thankful to the leadership that is happening in this church and many other churches that I supervise in the seven counties in this area. I always get blessed by Pastor Mark, Pastor Ben, and uh, Pastor Kiona when she's able to be here. <laughs> 
And I have been blessed by Pastor Kevin, Pastor Mike Reed. I see him somewhere at the Y. He prays for me. And many other pastors that we have here today, those who have served here, those who came from this church, those who are changing the world for Jesus. There's this one question that gets asked. What is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of this church? And especially, what is the purpose of Fisher's United Methodist Church? If only we existed here, and then we got next 10 years, we cease to exist. That would be the worst thing we can do to the mission. Brothers and sisters, the mission supersedes everything. The mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ here in this community supersedes everything. And my challenge to you all as you continue, Bishop Tremble brings greetings and he says, tell Fisher's United Methodist Church to be encouraged and to do mission to their highest potential. So, those blessings, they come with a message. And at this moment, I'm going to invite Kim and Art, if you don't mind coming forward, and our Art Council Chair, Dan Enke, if you can come forward, and Pastor Mark, if you don't mind coming forward so I can read this to you and to the church, but more so praying also for the one who is cooking in the kitchen. We have one pastor who says that he's cooking. <laughs> so... This, this message, I read it, and I'll be giving it to them. So, brothers and sisters, this is a message, a blessing from Bishop Julius Trimble. Oh, God, we thank you for the ministry of Fishers United Methodist Church as your people gather to celebrate 150 years. We thank you for all the pastors, lay leaders, and members who have made this day possible. And now I ask your richest blessings upon Reverend Mark Elsis, Reverend Kiona Bone, Pastor Benjamin Greenbaum, and the staff and leadership and upon all those who are a part of this congregation, particularly those whose lives are touched by this ministry. Keep them faithful to you, O oh God, and bless them with faith, strength, courage and service. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Bishop Julius C. Tremble, April 14, 2024. May God bless you. May God guide you. Blessings. Let us thank God for these leaders. There's no better way than to thank God and to praise God than simply to praise God. Let us stand and join together in the doxology. is taking shape, not simply here, but in you too. You're a masterpiece, not quite finished, that God is continually painting the picture of his purpose on the canvas of your life. We are grateful for God's goodness. And when your children, and your children's children, and your children's children's children ask their parents, what does this mean? Tell them God's story. Would you do that? Tell them his story. Ah, now the real purpose you came. There's free food down the hall. <laughs> we are so excited about that. And what we're going to ask everybody to do is when you exit this place, go, and go into the gymnasium and find a seat. Don't wait. Find a seat. We'll have a prayer in there and then release you to the food. That way everybody can be seated and comfortable as others are getting food. God bless you. Have a great day.